1977, Janet Guthrie became the first woman to compete at the Indianapolis 500. Janet, thanks for being with us today. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> so my first question is, how did a woman from Iowa with an aerospace engineering degree from Michigan end up at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway? I, well, I, I was born a adventurous and I grew up insufficiently socialized. <laughs> Actually, out on the Piney Woods southwest of Miami, my father flew for Eastern Airlines, and so I grew up from quite a young age in Miami. It's what feels like home to me, the palm trees, the Biscayne Bay. Um, I, but I, I started flying at quite a young age. I soloed when I was 16, the uh, um, um, youngest legal age and had a private pilot so at 17, com commercial and flight instructors before I got out of uh, college. And um, then I went to work as an aerospace engineer for Republic Aviation uh, out Long Island and Farmingdale outside of New York City. And um, there was so much air traffic control around there and so much traffic coming in from Europe and all over the world that you couldn't find a good place to go and do aerobatics. So instead of buying a, a World War II AT6 that I had my eye on, I bought a seven-year-old Jaguar XK120 instead. So that was the big watershed. And doing tricks in it instead. <laughs> uh, well, I, I at first I, I bought it just because it was such a beautiful thing. And then I found out what I could do with it and started running Gymkhana's hill climbs. Um, I um, got hooked pretty quickly and bought an XK140 Roadster. It was 500 pounds lighter than the coupe that I'd been driving to work and um, got my first Sports Car Club of America license in 1963. Not having a trust fund, I, I learned to build my own engines and do my own body work and all that kind of thing. And I, I raced the Jaguar for six years. Um, then I started getting rides at the Sebring 12 hour and so on. Um, and uh, then I built a Celica for what was then called the, um, let's see, it was the under two liter class of Trans Am, uh, but that was canceled. And uh, so I ran the, uh, the Celica for five years and then I was quite at the end of my string. I, I had one used up race car. Uh, I, I had no jewelry, no husband, no insurance, <laughs> no I uh, know nothing. And I was saying, you know, you really must come to your senses and uh, make some provision for your old age. And that was the point at which Rolla Volstead, whom I had never heard of, called me and asked if I'd like to take a shot at the Indianapolis 500. And it all went on from there. Your first shot, technically, 1976. This year, Janet, we are celebrating 45 years since you attempted that rookie orientation at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. What do you remember about that day? Well, I, I remember passing the rookie test, of course, um, but the really big event of that year was, uh, Rella Volstead was the most extraordinary man and I'll always be grateful to him. Uh, when it became clear that the car he had brought for me was not going to go fast enough to make the field in anybody's hands, uh, Rollo went out looking for a car to me to, for me to drive that would not be his. I, a really extraordinary thing for a team owner to do. And A.J. Foyt agreed to let me take his car out in practice on the last day of qualifying. And of course, we hoped that he would let me make a qualifying attempt with it. And in practice, I did go fast enough to make the field, but AJ decided not to let me make a qualifying attempt. So I had to wait until 1977. But 
the fact that I brought his car up to speed so quickly, I mean, it, it was an incredible car, um, changed a lot of people's minds. And I'll always be grateful to AJ for that. So often you hear the phrase, if you can see it, you can be it. There was no woman for you to look at and say, she's been in the Indianapolis 500. What made you say, I can do this? Well, I was a racing driver right through to the bone marrow. And uh, I, I, I think I said at the time, you, you can't guarantee success before you try something. But if I hadn't thought I could do it, I wouldn't have tried it. I did think I could do it. One of my favorite stories that I've heard you tell that I'm not sure how often you really tell, but 1978 was the first time that you actually completed the Indianapolis 500 and you had a broken wrist. Oh, that, yes. Well, uh, that wasn't the worst of our problems. I mean, it was certainly quite a nuisance, um, but uh, probably the worst single problem was a, um, blocked vent in the pit side fuel supply. And in addition, I had done something really stupid and I should have known better. I wore a new and different kind of face mask, uh, which had eye holes and it sagged down into my field of vision. And there were little um, uh, wisps of stuff flying around in my field of vision that was a, a great nuisance, but the, um, the the fuel supply problem probably cost us, oh, at least three laps. It was terrible. It's so racer-like of you to say, well, the biggest problem was actually with the car, not the fact that I had a broken bone. <laughs> <laughs> it was just fractured. I mean, it wasn't as if my wrist were... Uh, uh, shattered or anything like that, but um, I had to shift with my left hand. I could hold the steering wheel all right with my right hand, uh, but I had to, you know, the, I, I don't know what they're like now, but back then um, the gates for the uh, gears, one, two, three, and four at that time um, were very sloppy. You're one tough cookie. <laughs> what was the welcome like at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway or the not so welcome maybe? Um, well, um, at, at the beginning, the general idea was um, women don't have the strength. Women don't have the endurance. Women don't have the emotional stability. <laughs> women are going to endanger our lives. And um, to see those attitudes change was one of my greatest pleasures because they did change when they found out I knew what I was doing. I was a clean driver. I could give them some good competition. And um, that, that was a great pleasure to me to see that change. So much has changed since you first came to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in so many ways. Is there one that you are most pleased to see? Well, it's very nice to have women's rooms in the garage area, which <laughs> I didn't have when I was there. Leo Mel, the great good guy who uh, ran Goodyear's racing program, had a tiny little office um, in the garage area and that tiny little office, this was back in the days of the wooden garages, it had a bathroom in it and Leo gave me a key to that office and it was my most precious possession <laughs> at the racetrack. It meant I didn't go, have to go out into the spectator area to find a women's room. What do you hope your legacy says and stands for for years to come? Well, um, I, I, uh, I rather feel as if uh, <laughs> sometimes I feel like a, a cat with tin cans tied to its tail. <laughs> I'll never get beyond being the first woman to earn a starting spot in the Indianapolis 500 and also in the Daytona 500. Um, but I, I I would just 
like to be remembered as a damn good racing driver is what I would like my legacy to be. And then there's my book, of course, which is out of print at the moment, uh, but I'm trying to get it back into print again. I, I spent a long time writing it and uh, Sports Illustrated called it um, an uplifting work that is one of the best books ever written about racing. And uh, I would really like to get that back in print again. So we know what kept you busy for a little while after racing your book, but what keeps Janet Guthrie busy now? Well, that at my age, I'm not doing anything particularly extraordinary. <laughs> for quite a long time here in the mountains of Colorado, I had a little hiking group, usually between four and eight women, and we would go off to do 25, 3,000 feet altitude gain, uh, beginning at 10,000 feet, that kind of thing. And I really enjoyed that a lot. So you're saying with the hiking, the need for adrenaline never really goes away. Well, um, it's, uh, I, th I think it does actually. When I look back at all the stuff I did, I mean, flying airplanes from Chicago to Miami when I was 18 and, and all that kind of thing. It's, and the racing, it's almost as if another person did those things. I've, I've seen that in autobiographies before. When you get to this point, you look back and you say, who was that person? <laughs> what are you most proud of in your career? Well, um, Let's see. Um, top 10 finishes and top 10 qualifying positions, both in IndyCar, where I only ever drove 11 races, and in NASCAR Cup racing, where I drove 33 races. Um, I think my sixth place finish in NASCAR is in 33 races is tied with Danica who drove several hundred races. Uh, so I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, I wish I had been able to find the funding to continue longer. Well, on behalf of myself and many women in racing these days, thank you for everything and all the trails that you blazed for us. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Always good to see you, Janet. Thank you.